what gets under your skin, what tests your tolerance, what drives you up the wall. For me, it's toast. I get out into the kitchen, and the first thing I do in the morning, I put the bread in the toaster. And then I go ahead and pour my second cup of coffee and get a plate and a knife out, pull out the peanut butter from the uh, pantry. I even put a little bit of fruit on my plate, and still the toast has not popped up. I stand there. And sometimes I have to wait almost 20 seconds. Seems like an eternity. It gets under my skin. Of course, so does traffic. I, 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 um, I uh, am put off by traffic. I, uh, um, I, I just want, when I'm in traffic, I just want all the cars in front of me, come on, let's, let's go. Let's move. We got places to be. Let's stop being silly. Let's just get past whatever the obstacle is. Let's move. I'm also finding that um, my patience is tried by political commercials that seem to be quite comfortable with twisting and turning the narrative to their advantage to misrepresent the, the full statement an opponent might have made or, or, or to uh, put things in such a way that it plays more on emotion than it does on truth. I've also found this year uh, I, um, that pandemics get under my skin. Hadn't had that experience before, but now I know. You know, when something tries our patience, it's uh, not unusual to become frustrated. And if we're frustrated, we, be, we can become irritated. And if we're irritated, we become uh, quite possibly agitated. In frustration, irritation, and agitation if we're not careful, can result in groaning and growling and grumbling. And then if we don't watch ourselves, all of a sudden it becomes demanding and shouting and quite possibly attacking. Now, thankfully, James has some words to share with us in this situation of when our patience is being tested. And our passage this morning is James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to encourage you to open it, and we'll put the words on the screen as well. This is from James 5, verses 7 through 11. Hear the word of God. Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. May God, may God add his blessing to the reading of his word, and may God bless our time together as well. All right, so in this passage, context matters. Context, we might even be able to say, context is everything and in this passage, what we find in the context is that there's these two things that exist side by side. On one hand, there is a temporary injustice at play. And yet at the same time, there is a theological truth that is to be determinative for that context. A temporary injustice and a theological truth. Well, let's first take a look at the temporary injustice. In James's time, the particular temporary injustice, we talked about it last week. There was this economic injustice. There were these rich landowners, these non-Christian rich landowners that were exploiting the day-to-day -day workers. It was so prevalent. In fact, it was the majority situation. It was the context and injustice. 
an injustice that was assigned to that context. You know, today we might talk about some of the injustices we experience. We might even frame the pandemic as an injustice. That how dare that, that this pandemic would come into our lives and upset our plans. And for some of us, that might be a special day that we had planned. For others, it may be that I just like to be more mobile. I want to be able to do these various things in my life. And it just doesn't seem right. And yet we also know that there are families and there are population groups in our communities that are being um, affected by the pandemic in ways that we just really mourn and, and we feel a sense of loss alongside them. We might see that in the midst of the election that there are injustices. We, we could see that uh, among Christians that there are injustices that are being perpetrated as as. Christians, rather than representing the, the love of Christ, are choosing to stand up and, 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 and shout for their rights instead. Maybe I could look at my own life and see the injustices I commit toward other people of not listening or paying attention or, 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 or not supporting in, in the way that God would call me to support. Maybe you can do the same. You see, injustices come in all shapes and sizes. They can be anything from a minor irritation to a global oppression. And one of the things then about these injustices is that we end up experiencing stress because of them. We've talked about stress before. The Cleveland Clinic defines stress this way. Stress is the body's reaction to any change that requires an adjustment or response. Stress is the body's reaction to any change that requires an adjustment or a response. So the issue becomes critical when stress becomes distress. Distress is the negative response to these outside influences. And so we see in our physical beings, distress can be manifested as headaches and upset stomach, as elevated blood pressure, chest pain, or problems sleeping. Of course, it's not just the body. It can be our emotions that are impacted as well. And so we feel irritable and angry, general anxiety and depression, and we experience panic attacks. And because of things like this, then that impacts community around us. Our bodies are impacted, our, our emotions are impacted, and, and then we impact in a negative way the relationships around us. Well, the Cleveland Clinic then gives tips on, on how we combat all this stress and distress. And their number one uh, uh, response, or their number one tip to, to, for us to be able to live out to combat all this stress and distress is this. Keep a positive attitude. It sounds like, seriously, we just described all this stuff going on and these, these global oppressions and all things taking place and keep a positive attitude. But before we cast that aside, we might do well to pay attention to James's words. So let's take a look at the theological truth. There was a temporary injustice, but there's a theological truth. The truth that mattered to James's time, a truth that God would say matters to our time. You know, there's been quite a bit of talk lately about the development of a vaccine. Uh, a, a vaccine typically takes a, a piece of the virus itself and... and uh, Man, that the scientists have manipulated it and, and that it's a dead piece and, and yet the, they can introduce that to the body and, and, and the body then develops an immune response. It recognizes that, that piece of virus and it develops an immune response so that when the live virus is introduced to the body, the body's already prepared to fight the virus. But that's different than a cure. A, a, a cure says, says, I'm going to come in, I'm going to heal you, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you full and well, and, and you're not even going to have any issues at all. I'm not just going to trick your immune system, I'm, I'm going to make you well. And so James offers a theological truth as a cure to the injustices. 
as, as, as the response that, that trumps and triumphs over the injustices. And so if we look at the, at the scripture, we find in uh, chapter 5, verse 8, these words. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. There's a word being used in this text, a word that uh, we translate as the coming. It's the word parousia. Parousia is, is this Greek word that means presence or coming, and, and, um, but it's become a word that stands for so much more for Christians. The parousia re, uh, um, it, it uh, reflects the coming of Christ. It, it, it is a word that stands for the, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ's return. And I thought this morning as, as we um, are given this theological truth in this passage, this, that, the, um, that the coming of the Lord is near. And by the way, you may have heard that expression before, is near or is at hand. Do you recall the teachings of Jesus when he said that the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is near. That in Jesus Christ, that, that, that through his life, death, and resurrection, he was inaugurating God's rule in this world. And one day when he returned, when he made all things new, that it would be consummated, it would be full, it would be brought to its fullness. And now James says that the return of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, the parousia is at hand. So let's just take a moment and take a look at what we can understand about that day. The first text we're going to look at, we're going to go through a few texts here, that uh, Acts 1.11. So this is when Jesus had just risen to, um, had just ascended to be with the Father in heaven, and the disciples are standing around, and there, there are these two white men in, in or these two uh, men in white robes, excuse me, these two men in white robes, uh, these angels that speak to them. And here's what they say. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. In the same way. Listen, you looked, you saw Jesus ascending to be with the Father. He's going to come back and he's going to come back in the same way. Jesus, when he was in this world, he said these words. This is in Matthew 24, verse 30. Jesus said, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. The Son of Man was a way Jesus referred to himself. The sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. All the tribes, all the nations, all the people of the world will see this. This will be a global event. And that when Jesus returns, he'll return with power and great glory. We look next to Revelation eleven fifteen, And here as, as um, uh, <clears throat> it's being read out, this, this, the, it says there that uh, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. On that day, on the parousia, in the coming of Jesus, the kingdom of this world will give way. It'll be transformed. It'll be replaced. It'll become the kingdom of our Lord, a whole shift, a new kingdom. Then we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, Paul writes, For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. On that day, we will be together. Those who have died in the Lord and those who are still alive. 
at that time. And do you notice even in Paul's words, there was the expectation that Paul had that it would even possibly be in his lifetime. We'll next turn to Revelation 22.20. There we find, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This is the expectation James had. That the coming of the Lord is near. It is at hand. There's going to be a shift. The, the, the kingdom of this world is going to be replaced. It's going to happen soon. Be ready. You know, with regard to this expectation, we would be right in saying that James was wrong in his expectation. That James' expectation was wrong. He expected Jesus to return during his lifetime, and Jesus didn't return during his lifetime. We could even say that every generation of Christian that has died, and they had the expectation that Jesus would return, that their expectation turned out to be wrong. And yet, we can say that having the expectation was the right thing to do. That they were so right in their expectation that even though it turned out not to be the case, that just holding the expectation was God's calling upon them. This is in Second Peter um, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. It'll come like a thief. And that expectation is to be fully present all the time, that this could be the day that Jesus returns. Only the Father knows the time. But this could be the day. And even if we get to the end of our life, whenever the end of our life occurs, and we find out that Jesus did come back during our lifetime, to hold the expectation is the right, th right thing for followers of Christ to do. So we have our current context. Like the people of James' time, we have our own experience of injustices. But like the people of James's time and all times since, we have the theological truth that the return of Christ is imminent. It's about to happen. And it makes all the difference no matter what happens around us. Maybe in a way we could say that it's kind of like gravity that way. You know, we don't see gravity. We... we don't necessarily, most of us on a day-to-day -day basis, don't have a full working understanding of how all of gravity comes together. But we know it's best not to step out of the 56th floor of a building or off of a cliff because gravity wins. Well, here we know we may not be able to see the return of Jesus. We may not be able to touch the return of Jesus. But James is saying, listen, it's at hand. It is true. And it's, it, it's a kind of truth that trumps and triumphs over every single injustice. With this in mind, then, he has some instructions. The coming of the Lord is near, so be patient. The coming of the Lord is near, so be patient. You could look up the definition of patience. It's the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. Here's what we know from Scripture about patience. There's this Greek word, makrothemeo, makrothemeo, and and so when we look to see how that word is used in Scripture, 
we look to the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, and we find that it was used uh, to translate the words of God when God passed in front of Moses. And in that experience, as God was passing in front of Moses uh, up on Mount Sinai, what we find are these words, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord, a, a, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, Macrothemeo was the word they used to translate slow to anger, patient. God had a purpose he was about. And in his timing, he would work that purpose out and he was slow to anger. He was patient. We find then also, even in the New Testament, the same type of response. This is in 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient. Macrothemeo, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is patient. It's who God is. Not slow is how some count slowness, but he's got a purpose he's pursuing. Okay, so if God is macrothemeo, if God is patient, the next thing we learn is that God works patience in us. In Galatians 5.22, we, we find that list of the fruit of the Spirit. That the fruit of the Spirit, if, if God's Spirit is in us and through Jesus Christ we have the Spirit of God, what is the Spirit accomplishing in us? As we expect to grow, as, as God is transforming us, what does the Spirit bring about? Love, joy, peace, patience, macrothemeo, macrothemia, bringing about patience. That's what God works in us. The third thing we find, though, is that we choose to be patient. We're called to choose patience. When Paul wrote about love in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, love is patient. If we're going to choose to love, it's choosing to be patient, to bearing with others. It's not a passive thing. It's not like we just unplug and say, okay, I'll find, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. It's not just waiting, but it's waiting with a purpose. It's remaining active and engaged. And then what James does is he gives us three examples. He says, hey, why don't you just think about the farmers? He says, listen, the farmers get excited about the fruit coming and, and, and they, they wait for the early rains and the late rains. That would have been November and October would be the early rains and then March and April would be the late rains. And, and in that time, the farmer's not disengaged. The farmer's active in weeding and, and um, fer fertilizing the soil and, and, and taking care of, of the plants, but the farmer's patient on God's provisions. He gives the example of the prophets. He says, listen, the prophets suffered and they were patient. That we look to their suffering and their patience, that these uh, individuals who were speaking on behalf of God and they're calling God's people back to obedience and yet they weren't seeing the fruit of their calling. We might think of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, they threw him into a cistern. <laughs> And, and Jeremiah would talk with God about his own experience of, of frustrations, but Jeremiah remained faithful in that time. He was patient, trusting that God was up to something bigger. And then James provides the example of Job. And we might go, really, Job? Job seemed to confront God a lot uh, in response to what he was experiencing. And the story of Job is, is that... Um, uh, that the evil one came to God and said, you know, this Job is just praising you because his life is going so well. And, and God said, well, go ahead, you know, uh, um, take those things away from him. We'll see. And, and so those things are removed. And, and Job's wife says, you know, you should just curse God and die. But Job doesn't. He remains in that relationship and he has this conversation with God. 
And God remains in relationship with him and there's this patience. And after the examples, what we find is that, that patience is the smart thing to do, is the smart response in light of the facts. It's the smart response in light of the facts that God is sovereign and that the return of the Lord is near. James puts it this way, you have seen his purposes. You have seen his ends, his telos. You have seen it, you've seen it, that God is compassionate and merciful. In light of this evidence, we know that God is good and trustworthy and that God is patient and that Jesus is coming back. And so we choose to be patient for the coming of the Lord is near. The coming of the Lord is near, so establish your heart. Establish your hearts. Strengthen your hearts. The NIV puts it, stand firm, which captures the meaning. I think I've mentioned the trees out in front of my house before, and, and we've got these two beautiful trees out in front of our, ho- our house, and they've got this big ball of roots uh, that comes up above the ground. And when I talk with people walking by my house, yeah, I'm one of those guys that talks to people walking by their house, they seem to always mention the big ball of roots coming up out of the ground. It looks something like out of the Lord of the Rings, like, like the tree's got, has personality and it's reaching out to the ground. But you know, if the tree only had those fancy roots, that big ball of root that was spreading out over the ground, if that's all the root system it had, my house would be in danger. You see, the trees are to the west of... Our, our front door, and, and if the wind tends to come from the west, and they would just simply fall over onto the house. You see, it's important that those trees have deep roots, not just fancy kind of roots up at the top, the kind of roots people talk about, but it's important that those trees have deep roots. And so when James says, establish your hearts, he calls us to have deep roots, to stand firm, In light of the coming of the Lord, establish yourself in Christ. Be deep-rooted. The first thing for us to know about this is that it's doable. That that God wouldn't call us to it if it wasn't doable. You know, we've talked about this year that that we have this expectation to grow, that God is going to grow us. Our job is to expect it, to to yearn for it, to, to know that God is at work in us. And so we read the Bible not just to get the information, but so that God would use that information, that direction to change us. We we participate in a life group not just to have social connection, but but because we trust that God will use the voices of others to speak into our life. We go out on mission and participate in mission activities, not just because it sounds like something good, but because we can see the provision of God as we depend upon Him. We share the good news of the gospel Because in sharing the good news of the gospel, we experience the good news of the gospel. We tell it to ourselves. It's doable. We don't just study the Bible, nor are we just obedient. We take these two things together. We study Scripture and we choose to be obedient. This is being established in Christ. The other thing we learn about this is not only doable, but it's a daily choice. It's doable daily. They um, were talking about trees during uh, uh, one of the Weather Channel reports on the hurricane this past week. And that how trees are at greater risk when, when development encroaches upon them. When the, when the sidewalks and the streets and the homes get closer to the trees because the trees don't have the ability to, to hold on to the ground as much through their root system. And it may be that our hearts function the same way, that the more we let culture encroach on our hearts, then it's harder to have that deep-rooted establishment in Christ. And we let our hearts be full of the things of the culture. Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying. God calls us to be in culture. We're not to to remove ourselves from culture. We're to be in, in culture, but we don't want it to encroach on our hearts. Stand firm. Establish your hearts. The coming of the Lord is near, so do not grumble, grumble against one another. You know, the stress of injustices, as we've already discussed, can induce division. It can lead us into divisive relationships. 
We can mistreat each other. We can think the worst of one another. We get agitated and, and frustrated and irritated, and so we grumble and we groan and we growl, and, and then that turns into demanding and shouting and attacking one another. But what if we were to choose, in light of the nearness of Christ's return, what if we were to treat each other knowing that there's a possibility that Christ might return today? That this day is full of the hope and expectation of Jesus' return. And so what if we listened to one another? What if we loved one another in light of Jesus' return? We know that Christ loves. We know that Christ saves. We know that Christ forgives. But this returning Christ also judges. Here's this text from Revelation 22, verses 12 and 13. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Bringing his recompense. I love the translation. Bringing his recompense. Um, some other translations will say, I'm bringing rewards. And unfortunately, the connotation in our culture when we hear rewards is, oh, good. <laughs> Can I get an award too? Um, recompense is this idea of wages. And that's the word. It's wages. What is due us. Now listen, we are saved by grace. We are absolutely saved by grace. But that grace brings about change in us. It, it brings about a devotion in us, a standing firm in us, that God is at work transforming us into the image of Christ. And the judge is coming back. You are saved by grace, but that grace changes us. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. And His coming is at hand. So do not grumble against one another. So what tries your patience? Does President Trump try your pa patience? Do the Democrats try your patience? Does corporate America try your patience? Do white, does white privilege try your patience? Do people who talk about white privilege try your patience? How about racism or the pandemic or wearing masks or people refusing to wear masks? Do governors or mayors try your patience? Do people who think they are entitled try your patience? How about the lack of health insurance to millions of people? Does that try your patience? Or food scarcity or homelessness or taxes or crime? Maybe on a more personal note, do your children try your patience? Or your spouse? Or your pastor? Get this. Jesus is coming back. He's the cure. It's a promise. And his return is at hand. We can expect it. In fact, our life is to be full of that expectation. So let's choose to be patient with one another. Let's just choose to establish our hearts in Christ. And let us not grumble with one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that who you are is good. That you are compassionate and merciful. And we thank you, God, that in this good gift of Jesus, that it's not just a gift we look back on, but it's a gift we anticipate. That his return is at hand. And that our lives are to be full of that expectation. God, wherever we are doubting, wherever we are distracted, wherever we are despairing, would you meet us? And would you increase our faith? And may the truth of your promise, may your promise of Jesus' return become determinative in our life. Guide our choices. Guide our awareness. Guide our devotion. We give you praise. In Christ's name, amen. 